one day before the spring break. And um, it's my great honor and pleasure, first of all, to welcome Eugene Ostaszewski uh, to our series Russian Culture Hunter. However, uh, he will be reading in English and he's writing in English, so Russian, the concept of Russian culture is here expanding uh, today, this moment. Uh, actually, it's uh, a pleasure to welcome Eugene back uh, because he's read at Hunter before. And today, uh, Eugene will present two of his newly published books, which you see there, which are also available for sale. Uh, the Pirate Who Does Not Know the Value of Pi, his long poem about, you will hear what it is about. And the second book is The Fire Horse, uh, Mayakovsky, Mandelstam, and Harms' Poetry for Children, which he translated beautifully into English. Both, uh, once again, are there, I think, for the price of $10, for the pirate, and 12 So since immigrating to Leningrad, from Leningrad to New York with his family at the age of 11, that is, 79, uh, Eugene has been writing poetry only in English. And for the past several years, he's been teaching in the liberal uh, studies program at NYU Paris while living in Berlin. Uh, so it's quite an adventure already, and some of that, I think, makes its way into uh, the plot of the poem about the pirate and the pirate. Uh, he is the author of several earlier collections of poetry, including literature and the life and opinions of DJ Spinoza, uh, both of which were published by Agvita in Press, and we'll have more events associated with this beautiful uh, really wonderful publishing house from Brooklyn later on this semester, including <laughs> Julia Trubikina's uh, translation of Arista. Eugene's passionate and masterful work with language, whether English or Russian, or oftentimes both of them are the same simultaneously, is inspired by his interest in the aesthetics of the Very uh, especially Alexander Vindiansky and Daniel Harms, whom he also has translated into English and worked on as a scholar. Language in Eugene's poetry, own poetry, as you will hear in a second, is constantly brought to its extreme, as far as I hear and see it, and reinvented not only as a means of communication, but also as a vessel, as a receptacle for philosophy, logic, mathematics, and all other types of languages, whether verbal or not. What you will hear today is a dialogue between the pirate and his parrot, to look for a common language and arrive at some fascinating existential conclusions along the way. Uh, the room we have for this uh, exciting poetry reading today is a regular classroom, uh, which is not our usual setting, but believe me, it will not be boring, even though it may look like a classroom. So let's give the floor to the pirate and the parrot whose voices Eugene will impersonate, <laughs> and uh, please join in welcoming him to Hunter. <laughs> um, all right, look, I'm going to start by reading uh, from this book, which is a book of translations of uh, three uh, picture books from the 1920s uh, by very prominent um, early Soviet era poets, Mayakovsky, Mandelstam, and Harms, writing for children. Um, and illustrated by, um, uh, well, two of the books are illustrated by avant-garde artists. If you look at those children's illustrations like this, you can uh, pretty easily see the way that they derive from the influence of geometric abstraction, uh, suprematism on pictures like this. Um, uh, that was Lydia Popova who uh, did illustrations for Mayakovsky. Here's Boris Ender, who was a student and pupil of Matyushin, and also an abstract painter doing pictures for Mandelstam. It's extremely elegant um, uh, with um, uh, just these beautiful lines uh, and kind of a minimum, but but um, of color, but but with very sharp contrast. Um, I'm gonna read just one of the poems. 
which is a piece by Daniel Harms called Gra, which means play, or it means game. Um, I think it's the best children's poem in here because uh, it gets into the mind of a child uh, instead of uh, talking like an adult to a child, which is what Mayakovsky does. Uh, so it's a, it's a very empathetic, imaginative poem. Um, but another thing that is interesting about it, another reason why it's good to start with it, is because it uh, shows children playing, imagining, and it itself formally is a kind of play. It's a formally very, very sophisticated, very rhythmically complex work, as you will see, right? And, yeah. and as a consequence, um, uh, in a certain sense, if you think about you know, what literature is, if you think about what art is, especially poetry, uh, uh, the factor of play is always very prominent. Uh, in it. And in fact, I think it, the instinct it derives from is the kid's play instinct. Um, and, you know, if, um, at least for me, maybe other people work differently, but for me as a, as a writer, um, I only know when I wrote something that's good when it feels playful, when there's a kind of freedom in it, right? Play is freedom, lack of play is crap. <laughs> Peter ran down the road, down the road along the pavement. Peter ran down along the pavement and he hollered, Roo, roo, roo. I'm not Peter any longer. Everybody move aside. I'm not Peter any longer. I'm on wheels. I'm a car. Vasco ran behind Peter down the road along the pavement. Vasco ran along the pavement and he hollered, Do, do, do! I'm not Vasco any longer. Out of the way, steer clear. I'm not Vasco any longer. I'm a steamboat from now on. Mikey ran behind Vasco down the road along the pavement. Mikey ran along the pavement and he hollered, Zoo, zoo, zoo! I'm not Mike any longer. Pay attention. Practice safety. I'm not Mike any longer. I'm a Soviet airplane. <laughs> A cow was walking down the road, down the road, along the pavement. A cow was walking along the pavement. It was mooing, moo, moo, moo. <laughs> Just a real genuine cow with some real genuine horns walked towards them on the road, taking up the whole wide way. Hey, you cow. <laughs> hey, you cow, you milky mookie, don't walk here, milky mookie, don't walk here on the road, don't walk here along the way. Move aside, shouted Peter. Steer clear, shouted Vasco. Pay attention, shouted Mikey. And the cow did move aside. They stopped running at the finish by the bench beside the gate. Steamboat, car, and Soviet airplane, airplane, car, and Soviet steamboat. Mike, Peter jumped up on the bench. Vasco jumped up on the bench. Mikey jumped up on the bench, on the bench beside the gate. I'm parked, shouted Peter. I cast anchor, shouted Vasco, and I landed, shouted Mikey. Then they sat down to rest. They were sitting, they were resting on the bench beside the gate. Airplane, car, and Soviet steamboat, steamboat, car, and Soviet plane. Hit the gas, shouted Peter. Sail onwards, answered Vasco. Keep off flying, hollered Mikey. And they took off once again. And they took off and they sped off down the road along the pavement, jumping, skipping, hopping, springing, loudly shouting, zoo, zoo, zoo. Jumping, skipping, hopping, springing down the road along the pavement. Ran so hard their heels were flashing as they shouted, do, do, do. Ran so fast their heels were flashing down the road along the pavement, throwing hats up in the air, loudly shouting, roo, roo, roo. <laughs> on the wrong glasses, the ones I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the other glasses. Um, it's weird, I changed them before reading. And I guess I took off the right ones and put on the wrong ones. <laughs> I'm going to take a rabbit out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, all right, I'm going to read Wait, do you need reading glasses? Just reading? I just have them somewhere. I have reading glasses. No, no, no. <laughs> What prescription are they? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave my glasses, it's fine. Um, it just means I'm going to have to lean forward. Um, so this book, uh, The Pirate Who Does Not Know the Value of Pi, started off as a children's book, uh, but it just kept getting more and more complicated. Um, um, and, and I'm just going to start reading and we'll see. The history of the pirate who does not know the value of pi and his parrot goes way back to the ancient geeks and possibly even backer. Homer did not insert it into the Odyssey because he wished to avoid epic retardation. Hesiod kept it out of works and days because he couldn't decide which it was more, works or days. It was Civicus that composed the definitive version in Elegia Quadruped. However, his dog ate it. Civicus succeeded in making his dog throw up, but unfortunately proved unable to read the contents. <laughs> the high point of my poetic life, manger, cried Civicus and rushed off to the Agora, but got lost on the wave because he had rhapsodic memory disorder, which is why he couldn't reconstruct the elegy in his head. When Sidicus got to the Agora, he felt perplexed as Phinxia. Which of these columns is Doric? Which is ironic? And which is Corinthian? He was in order to beat his head against the column of the ironic order in frustration. Let us return to the pirate and his biota. One day, the pirate and the parrot were sitting within view of a river. It was over 120 degrees, but the parrot started to cough and quiver. Gosh, I do hope he hasn't caught some, well, no, let me do the voices. Gosh, I do hope he hasn't caught some fever, thought the pirate. What kind of fever might I possibly have caught, thought the parrot. Any kind, thought the pirate. Childbed fever, glandular fever, yellow fever. Good God, thought the parrot. Or maybe typhoid fever, thought the pirate. Hemorrhagic fever, Q, -f -q fever. He got impatient with just thinking. What's Q fever? It's characterized by high fever, muscular aches, and sometimes paranoia, explained the pirate. That is caused by a microorgasm of which domestic animals serve as reservoirs and is of which domestic animals serve as what? Interrupted the parrot. Reservoirs. Reservoirs, asked the parrot. Reservoirs, said the parrot. I don't think I have that, said the parrot. <laughs> well, what do you have then, asked the parrot. Probably parrot fever, said the parrot. I don't know it, said the parrot. If I remember correctly, said the parrot, it's a mild but infectious disease of birds, easily transmissible to humans, in whom it occurs as a fatal flu-like illness, often accompanied by numismatic achillofoxes. Gosh, said the pirate. I hope it's not that. I hope it's just hay fever. You hope I can be allergic to green things? Asked the parrot in disbelief. I'm a parrot for Christ's sakes. And what am I, chopped liver? Protested the pirate. That locution is so out of place, replied the parrot. It's for when your talk partner categorizes herself or others in such a way as ought to have applied to you, but didn't. I said, I'm a parrot, and then you just so much as said, you're a parrot. You aren't a parrot, you're a pirate. You violated the language game. Yes, 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 said the pirate, peeling transgressively, triumphantly, and triadically. But I was playing another language game all along. Shiva me timbers! What kind of language game was the pirate playing, but might in fact have violated a second ago? You can't tell, because it tells you. This is the story of the pirate and his parrot, not unlike the ballad of Bonnie and Clyde, who, however, were a little more desperate and disparate. On the day of their meeting, the pirate was not yet a pirate. 
while not always aspiring to become one as an adult, he had amassed a vast private collection of pirate arms. Yataguns, grappling hooks, blunderbusses, <laughs> Malaysian chrises, 358 total. The parent was already a parent. How they met, closed circuit cameras agree, in a dark pet store in a bank day. Both nose and beak were full of mucus. Not a little nervously, the two confided in each other how much they loved to play with boorishly booming bazookas. They assaulted tourists from Bali all the way to the Venice Biennale, then took a trip down to California, where they worked as instructors of calisthenics, calibration, and calligraphy, cooked cauliflowers, and consolidated themselves in crime, and finally, with the proceeds, bought themselves a galleon in case they should come across a large store of gold bullion. <laughs> It was them they took to the sea and took up piracy. They raided packet boats, pedal boats, and boats at once packet and pedal, palanders, pirogues, pontoons, and gondolas made of metal dows, dinghies by darkers, catamarans and clippers, felucas, garucas, tankers, bathtubs and bathroom slippers. But whether on the wavy wave or on the coconut strewn shore, they never did forget that old dark and dank pet store, not even when filling their coffers or beheading recently met coffers. They worked hard, became successful and wealthy. They bought art and a split level house in New Jersey, although they were never in it for the cash, but because the criminal form of life is such a blast. <laughs> what a beautiful song, said the pirate. I wish I knew all the ship names in it. <laughs> Shh, said the pirate. We'll look them up later. Later when, asked the pirate. When this book is over, said the pirate. The pirate fell into deep thought. What will he exist when this book is over? He suddenly asked. If it's a good book, said the pirate. Okay. So, um, when I was working on this, the, all the poems were untitled. Um, but then my editor at the very end said, you know, you need to it's really hard to figure out what the plot in your book is. So you need to kind of either write a summary or at least title the poems. <coughs> or rather, he asked me to write a summary and I counter-proposed uh, titling the poems. So, I titled the poems. Um, I don't know how much clarity that brought in. The titles are hidden strategically in the front. But the title of the next poem is called Kuchenbecker in the Pirate and Parrot Fortress. The pirate sails... Oh, Kuchenbecker was a Russian poet. The pirate sails the Spanish main. His ship describes a mark of chain. He stands at the bow and imbibes champagne. He takes in the tingling air. The parrot squints from a migraine and would rather be elsewhere. I often think about the relationship of experience to language, says the pirate who does not know the value of pi. All these <coughs> things happen to us and we can't always match them with words. How does that make them different? Am I asking for something that like skirine fasle or can one maintain a position on the divergence between the verbal and the nonverbal? <laughs> with us, for instance, since you are so much more verbal than I, is your experience of the sea essentially other than mine? And I mean essential. Furthermore, can I in any way understand an experience that is other than mine, an experience that is authentically your experience, or rather my experience with a pronoun referring to somebody other than me? In the same way, if I had a girlfriend, how might I give her subjectivity its full due, thereby treating another human being as Kant says she deserves to be treated already by virtue of her humanity, and additionally by the virtue of her girlfriendness towards me. Would I need to draw attention from the, away from the signs and symptoms of our difference, such as, for instance, the more foregrounded of our sexual characteristics? Or would it, on the contrary, be best to say straight out, here are your sexual characteristics, and here are mine. They seem to be quite different. I don't really know what to do about that. I admit that it frightens me. 
right? And it did a lot of things for him. The other day, for example, when we attacked that merchantman bound for wherever it was bound, like for Abalonga from Cartagena, no? And boarded it for its cargo of regret. As I advanced against the enemy captain with my lucky falchion, the one whose scabbard has my mother's beadwork of quotations from Sidney Dabal, he of the spasmodic school, in my right hand, and my double sudden blunderbuss number 00 in my left, there was cannon smoke everywhere and splashes of blood and the hoarse shouts of the mortally wounded or the simply overexcited. He fought real well, I must say, with his two scimitars and a hand cannon, at least until I chopped off his right arm. Wait, was it his left? No, it was on my left, so it must have been his right. I suddenly became frightened. I don't really know of what, that I wouldn't be able to represent any of this in language, and the experience would vanish from the sensory world but at the same time take root inside me, unformulated, ineffable, and therefore not even truly a thing, certainly not truly mine, yet no one else's but mine, mine exclusively, inalienably, and so locking me at once inside and outside itself, although always in solitary confinement, as it were, like Yuhi Becker, in the Peter and Paul fortress, but without the tapping code, and also the fortress ineffable and the guards in Yuhi Becker himself, and also with Kuchelbecker being not just in the role of Kuchelbecker, but also the guard of Kuchelbecker, all the while remaining ineffable and impalpable and incorporeal, but at the same time barely kind of uncomfortably restless, just a bit, almost imperceptibly, but still uncomfortable. when you're a pirate. Arr! It's not that there's one step or only from glamour to slammer. It's that panic tips over your panorama and you're like, shiver me timbers, what am I doing in the sea and who am I anyway? Arr! <laughs> some pirates, though ailing, continue sailing, except when ailing, even sailing, feels like failing. Some stay at home masturbating and or emailing and some inhale wood glue off the tip of a harpoon due to fear of whaling. And some attend sessions with a pirate rather than public therapist where they sit bewailing their exile from childhood. <laughs> and some scuttle their skiffs and go down with them. Some get gold caps to signify allegiance to capitalism. Some give their cats an enema and study the cataclysm. Some take up skiing, some skating, some scurvy prevention counseling. In short, there's some schism. Seventeen old kosher salts on the dead man's chest. Only 1.75 liters of Captain Morgan Besser for that many survivors of alcoholism are. Oh, the privations of being a pirate, corsair, buccaneer, privateer. Thank you so much for being my friend, paradeer. Oh, shall we go now, Bardash, Captain, my captain? What? Excuse me? Where did you get that word? Captain, I got it from the Russian. It doesn't sound very Russian. Captain, this is no time for etymology. A Turkish dreadnought has opened her gun ports, and before me I see, in row upon row, the mouths of homologous ordnance. Dreadnoughts don't have gun ports, Botsman. Who are you going to believe, my eyes or your picture dictionary? <laughs> Music. Попугай, 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 давай, попугай, как следует. Извергов не извергай, виск извергай, виск испускай, попугай, повторяй, припев. Попирать помаленьку, напирать на попугая, пропирать попугая, подпирать опять, отпирать свое. Who's that singing so unnotingly in the crow's nest? Ebony mother, ahoy there in the crow's nest. What? I can't hear you. I'm in the crow's nest. You want cat of square root of 80 tails? Can't hear you. Cat, 8.944271. I'll never get to tails that way. 
Afraid not. So it has afraid not. Where can I get a new cat in the middle of the sea? Captain, the Turkish dreadnought is bearing down upon us. Watchman, how can she be bearing down upon us if you just saw her portholes? I am not responsible for my language, sir. Ebony mother, who gave me this Jack Spicer for a boatman? It was the market, sir. Freedom of trade, you said. Freedom of trade. Pirates don't believe in union wages. So you hired me. I'm not in the boatman's union. By training, I'm a parrot. I'm sock. He's so selfish as to bring up wages at this time. Captain, the Turkish dreadnought is frantically signaling. Find out what they want. Captain, I don't speak Turkish except for invective. Ahoy there, Turban the Ataturk, Michael Jackson is. <laughs> we don't speak Turkish. But what about your flag? It used to be Soviet, but we can't find the hammer. And the single handle fell off. <laughs> oh, half power sickle. Oh, cowardly dreadnought. Oh, battleship Patomkin village. Row, row, column, column. Siwodnya Topan, Zaftarni Paimal. Exactly, where the common goyim. What meaning do they speak of, Botsman? None. They let their words get the best of them, sir. In that case, the opposite punning of these pundits shall get no plaudits from this pirate, Botsman, for I pooped of these language games. I want meaning. You read my thoughts like a book, sir. Dedificazione colorum, great pun is dead by Plut, if you allow it, sir. And so, my pretty parrot, get the pirate ship ready for conflict. Ahoy! All hands on deck! Up, dogs! That's not what it means! Ebony mother! Nabardash! Don't fire until you see the signs of their white out! That was my version of a pirate movie. <laughs> after the invention of sound. <laughs> one pirate and one parrot boarded a carrack carrying cucumbers, comfits, confetti, coriander, cardamom cake, comforters, calamari, caryatids, and correspondence conveying convictions and condolences copiously for cargo. A carrack is a 15th century ship invented by white mice and especially popular with ducks. It has a high rounded stern with large aft castle, forecastle, and bowsprit. Why do I need all this cornucopia? said the pirate. For pirates, said the parrot. We collect it. But don't you ever ask yourself why? asked the pirate. I'm afraid of the chasm that would open up if I did, said the parrot, cleaning his cutlass. When I was a little cabin boy, confided the pirate as he chewed his cuticles among confit de canard draped over gun carriages smashed by cannonballs. My man of war was a book, and it would carry me to happiness. But now, what boots me all this booty, pirate, parrot? How am I to squeeze another carrack of commodities into the captain's cabin? Yet what self-storage is here except for Davy Jones's locker? I am afraid I may have erred in some of my choices, but when? Are there actual moments in our lives when we choose between this and that possibility? And if there are, aren't we usually choosing not what we think we're choosing, but something that we mistake it for, and which turns out to be another item entirely? Moreover, do I even have choice over how to choose? What I, what I mean is that, could I be myself, have chosen otherwise than I would have chosen if I were myself. Is this really what bothers you? asked the parrot. Wouldn't I really have to be outside of myself to know really from not really? asked the pirate. Maybe what really bothers me that is, I'm so sorry I asked, thought the parrot. <laughs> Since many of our prisoners come up with ransom money by taking loans from the same bank as owns the mortgage in our galleon, continued the pirate. <laughs> We might not even be fighting the system. The parrot turned pale. That way lies madness, he cried. But the pirate was already looking into the distance and singing most apuratically. Why was I so misguided as to become a pirate? Why did I park by the faithful pier and embark on a career of a buccaneer? 
If I'd been a poet all day long, I'd have pondered such problems as into how many parts would a pirate parse a past participle if a pirate practiced parsing past participles as opposed to proposing propositions about potential postulates when not partaking in pure persiflage with a participating parrot. <laughs> but I became a pirate. What is my profit on it? Oh, parrot, my choices are over. I cannot reset. Everything I do is mechanical. Is this what adulthood is like for everybody? <laughs> and he sat down among cucumbers, canapes, confetti, coriander, cardamom, coping mechanisms, comforters, currants, confessionals, cardiologists consuming chicken Kiev, connoisseurs of Campari, former nonconformists who capitulated equinship in the computer, candidates for the corps de ballet of the Caspian who turned into virulent accountants speaking to scampi at the restaurant Baku. <laughs> Was it my karma? asked the accountant, but the scampi cannot reply, it is cooked and none of them could compose him or herself over his or her compromises. Yes, they all sat down by the carbonated mineral waters of Babylon and became painful to look at. Thereupon the parrot peeled into his, the parrot's plumage. Why was I so misguided as to become a parrot? How can you empathize if you're talking about yourself? Peeled the pirate. It is hard for me to empathize, admitted the parrot. As a bird, I have no free will, but only instinct. I live in the now without sense of future or past. I cannot understand the words that I say or that are said to me, except as arbitrarily complex circumlocutions of a private and personal meaning, namely of Polly want a cracker. I heard you speak that way to me about my friends. I heard you speak that way about me to your friends. You think I didn't? Yet now, yes I did. What do you think, I'm deaf? You shout into your cell phone, pirate, because you have crappy reception, because you insist on getting that hook-shaped thing instead of like a normal Nokia, because you would rather play you're the prince of poop decks than open yourself up for any kind of partnership. And now you come to me with, ah, I may have erred in some of my choices like some carrot killing Achilles, because you want to be consoled by a bird who thinks the only word whose meaning is fully itself is cracker. <laughs> cracker yourself, cracker. <laughs> what have you got under the tricorn, a polynomial? <laughs> the second half of this poem is an actual interview with a pirate where I only changed one word. And the first half of this poem, I put together a bunch of websites. <laughs> I'm not trying to sell anything unless you want this inflatable rowboat. The plastic oars are free. Just joking. I'm a journalist and I want to interview you. See, you have an extraordinary story too. I want to know what makes you you. I want to know what you laugh at, what you cry at. I want to share your story with the world. Now, why did you become a pirate? Is this your first time speaking to somebody from a developed nation? Please don't be nervous. We don't bite. <laughs> um, my ambition is to get a lot of money so I can lead a better life. Now I have two lorries, a luxury car, and have started my own business in my town. I only want one more chance in piracy to increase my cash assets. Then I will get married and give up. <laughs> piracy is not just easy money. It has many risks and difficulties. Sometimes you spend months in the sea to hunt a ship and miss. Sometimes when we're going to hijack a ship, we face rough winds. And some of us get sick and some die. Sometimes you fail in capturing and sometimes you come under threat by foreign navies. But all we do is venture. Our work is seen by many in the coastal villages as an act of resistance. And we're viewed as heroes. A lot of people in coastal villages aspire to. That is an actual interview with a Somali pirate of the Street BBC. Um, okay, this is a uh, shanty, which is. Um, no, I don't want to do a shanty, it's too hard to do this. Okay, um, I'll do this section. 
<clears throat> One day, the pirate and the parrot went to see their friend, the nudnik, who became a jihadnik, as he energetically engaged in preparing eggplant salad with his whistling scimitar of Damascene steel while crouching outside the cave that constituted his secret location. Hola, hollered the parrot. Hola to you too, replied the nudnik, who became a jihadnik. My friends, he then added, it's such a perfect pleasure to see you. You parrot put on 15 pounds, you pirate are puffy and pale. How can you be so inhaled in this ambiance indoor ironic? Have some eggplant. It's rich in vitamins, it's 100% organic. <laughs> the friends tasted the eggplant and pronounced it good. In all my adventures in nature, avowed the good-natured pirate, whenever I took a break from plundering, to set out hiking, or as more usual, swimming, or when with my tread betraying escalating excitement, I entered an eating establishment such as restaurant, cafeteria, taco stand, noodle shop, kiosk, specializing in local specialties or that global gobble. I've never, and I mean never, never, no, I never, not ever, ever, ever tasted such enticing eggplant. <laughs> it is as gentle as babies when they're barely born, Yet not detrimental, like rabies infecting a mammal forlorn. Yes, it is tasty and zesty, like the leaping of a grasshopper above a freshly plowed furrow. Yet it's not noisy and nasty, like the weeping of a teeny bopper when she stands on the subway platform, thinking about ending it all because something her friends did awoke the Dracula for inner sorrow. No. It's more like that split second when the human pain of that young shopper, and more importantly, her resolution to throw herself under a train after Stephanie and Jenny compared her to a small landlocked sockeye salmon called Kakeni because that sort of insensitivity is common to young people from an outlying borough suddenly dissolves to the unheard strain of little orphan Annie singing tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. This eggplant, responded the nudnik who became a jihadnik because his therapist told him he kept too much on the inside neck, is of such elementary alignment that certainly the eater of this eggplant will at first feel like Al-Ghazali alleviating his asthma with albuterol in an alpine element, or alternately like Al-Farabi allegorizing his way out of an aporia asserted by Al-Razi over almonds and Alka-Seltzer in Albergo True Falsafar. But alas, there's always a but. What is the but? exclaimed the pirate and the parrot. It's the butt of my joke, smiled the nudnik who became a jihadnik because he grew tired of interpreting the world and thought he should get changing it, at least a whirl. For I have poisoned this eggplant. Yes, friends, I have poisoned this eggplant. But not like poison poison so that you fall down and expire. No, likely and unmethodically as if I were adding a seasoning like cumin or maybe cardamom, sufficient for diarrhea, lasting perhaps a few hours or several days, not more. You might ask what I meant by this action. Did I have a pedagogical intention underlying tactics that are psychological and gastroenterological or not? Are you kidding? Your visit for me is a holiday. I'm taking the whole week off work. I cooked up this gift of hospitality so that we share a laugh over my joke. Pirate. Don't eat the eggplant, parrot. It's poisoned. Parrot. Alack and well a day. Diarrhea. Here I come. Nudia. The last time we had this much fun was at Bat Girl's Bat Mitzvah, you guys. <laughs> the next page looks like this. There's, a, there's yeah, well, or yes, or any legal uh, uh, text with commentary. And the text is a gazal. And um, it um, starts with a quotation from Hafiz in the translation of somebody who's here. Hello, parrot, reciter of secrets. May your beak never lack sugar. Declare who teaches you to speak from the other side of a mirror facing your cage. So you believe the speaker a brother you do not have, and repeat after him who is and is not there. Declare. Declare in your pattern. Declare. The nudnik who became a jihadnik composed this poem for the parrot in apology. It exploits a psychological practice preserved in the Persian phrase book for speakers of Silk Road Padua. The term Tuti Pazaina stands for the person, a Persian, who teaches a parrot to speak while hiding behind a mirror in order that the parrot may believe that the speaker is also a parrot and imitate it. I don't know if this is true, but I read about it. 
commentators cannot concur concerning what occurs in the parrot's mind during its lesson. Does the parrot interpret the reflection as itself or as another parrot? Sound the saltians. Does the parrot know itself as an object able to be perceived from the outside by itself or by another? Banter the Bactrians. Does the parrot know itself to be merely imitating or personifying and that therefore it cannot be personifying itself? Query the Keresmians. Does the parrot know that the voice sounds out before the reflection opens its beak? Bavardize the Bavarians. Does the parrot know that while it itself is in a cage, the audiovisual stimuli it receives come from outside the cage? How does that affect language acquisition? So the speakers of Khatanis suck. It is difficult to know the mind of a parrot. Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad even proposes the following conundrum. When Adam was naming the animals, what did the parrot say back to him? Was it, you're the parrot? <laughs> and did Adam say back to him, you're the parrot? <laughs> and did the parrot say back to him, you're the parrot? And is that why so many species remained unnamed, <laughs> that new ones are being discovered and named even now to this day? Oh, first parrot, he apostrophizes. Oh, the first to commit the Holy Quran to memory. Oh, first pilot of that current whereby words whose credit accrues of common holding are alienated to our persons. Oh, the first to suggest that heavenly counsel the twin seals of the Bismillah and the Brismillah. In his poetics, under the title of Renting the Veil, Yaqub ibn Shak, that paragon of the natural style, asks, why is a ghazal like a Persian iron word? He labels the second, third, and fourth rhyme words as the first, second, and third parrot, respectively. A banal rhyme is a magpie, a rhyme that breaks the bounds of decorum is the cockatoo, and a poem that does not rhyme is an ostrich, for all it may do is watch others soar. See if you can guess who the protagonist of this piece is. Other commentators tell the story of a parrot trained by a Persian to speak like a person. On a sudden, he precipitated into spiritual prostration in doubt of not only his senses, but also reason. Yet the cure of the proof of Islam eluded him. The owner, a merchant of Astrakhan, sold them. The buyer also sold them. And so it went, each merchant growing as afraid and aghast as the last, until a parrot traveled to Amsterdam. There, at a pet market, a resident alien picked it up for a song. The resident alien soon authored a treatise maintaining that his sensations of an external world may actually be due to an illusion concocted by an omnipotent demon with a lying disorder. Humanists all over Europe applauded the argument. They had taken note of the author earlier when he maintained it more appropriate to live in a land whose language one can't understand. Clever enough. But the new proposal, like all prodigies of the human spirit, spoke to them personally. It showed them an intuition that they had without, having, without ever having had the intuition that they had. It reflected the contents of their own mind something they never would have been able to contemplate on their own. And its originality took their breath away. The author awoke famous. He had the parrot strangled. The crime brought him no rest. At night, a voice came to him saying, recite. And then it stated, I pledge to commit no plagiarism defined as the repetition or imitation of the language or thoughts of another. And the author saw his own person recite, confess, plead for pardon, grovel, re-recite, all the while pinching his right palm with the fingers of his left hand in secret. It didn't help. At night, a voice came to him saying, recite. And then it stated, I pledge to commit no plagiarism defined as the repetition or imitation of the language or thoughts of another. And the author saw his own person recite, confess, plead for pardon, grovel, all the while pinching his right palm with the fingers of his left hand in secret. Each time he sank into sleep, the dead parrot's voice rose to meet him 
as grating and repetitive as the surf. Two years of close personal torment passed before the poor man happened upon the third argument. Now he will certainly be able to cover his tracks. Here's a letter he wrote his friend, the famous author of A New Method and Extraordinary Invention to Dress Horses. The only way a man shows others that his body is not just a self-moving machine but harbors a soul with thoughts is by using words or other signs that stand for particular concepts and yet do not express any passion. A parrot can be taught to say hello to its master only by making the utterance of this word the expression of one of its passions. Thus, if it is trained to say hello with a cracker, its hello will express its desire to eat one. Correspondingly, everything that dogs, horses, and pigs learn to perform must express their fear, hope, or joy. Hence, they can perform it without thought. Although no animal is so perfect as to use signs to convey something that expresses no passion, all men are perfect enough to do so, since even the deaf invent special signs to express their thoughts. It is because animals have no thoughts, but only passions, that they cannot speak. Having no thoughts, they have no souls. Having no souls, they're nothing else than self-moving machines. Animals act naturally and by springs, like a watch. Do you know who this is? Yeah, it's Descartes, right? And the letter is basically almost entirely verbatim. I took one sentence from another letter and I changed a couple of words here and there. But it's the letter, it's 1653 to the Marcus of Newcastle. And the cool thing about the letter is uh, it, um, uh, it defines thinking uh, as purely as lack of self-interest. So you have so basically only when you do logical and mathematical operations do you have a soul. And if you want something, you're an animal and you're a machine. Which is, I mean, this is um, very interesting. Basically. <laughs> Um, from the same section. Yep, that's right. We sure got it in our hands. What do we have in our hands? You know, we sure got it in our hands. I don't have any you know on my hands. <laughs> Parrot. You don't have hands. You're only a bird. What of it that I don't have hands? I have organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions. I wasn't going there. Can't you tell what I mean? I can't tell what you mean. Of course you can tell what I mean. We have it in our hands. <laughs> you might tell what you mean to have in your hands. Why do you presume to speak for me? What gives you that right? I was just supposing that as you, again, me, suppose yourself. Why do you pick on me? Because I, make, I can't make heads or tails of what you're saying. All I'm saying is that both, we both have it in our hands, except you don't have hands. <laughs> is that all you're saying? You won't say what you mean by it? I can't. I have it on the tip of my tongue. You have it anywhere else? What do I have? This is like chasing your own tail. Parrot, I don't understand you. I have hands. You have a tail. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You're the one I got it from. If you got it from me, then I would know what it is, but I don't know what it is, so there. Just yesterday, you said that every time you use your head, you wind up with a, you know, a da, da, dire. Dire? Da, diaspora. Dia no, it's like diaspora, but it's not di I kind of swallowed what I was about to say. <laughs> Pirate. Do you mean aporia? Maybe. It's a big word. You mean aporia. That's right. Aporia. We sure got it on our tails. <laughs> OK. And then they get uh, a little bit of OK. I'll do a few more. They get shipwrecked. Um, And stuff like this happens. Okay. 
I'll just I'll do the language section. They get shipwrecked and they just sit around and banter for a good few pages. I'm getting so used to this island that's becoming like second nurture to me. What if we never get rescued? Maybe you should think about catastrophe as an opportunity to become a better person. I don't want to be a better person. I want to be a better parent. <laughs> How could you be a better parent? There's always room for improvement. I could learn new words. You already have such a vast vocabulary, especially for a non-native speaker. <laughs> Why am I a non-native speaker? I've been speaking your language so long, I might as well be native. It's my native language. Your native language is parrot. I forgot parrot. Your native language is what you learn in your infancy, which in your case is parrot. I've been speaking your language so long, I forgot parrot. There's no such category as naturalized speaker. I speak as well as you and use many words you don't. The words I know come more naturally and I feel their meanings more. How would you go about evidencing that statement? It's not me speaking, it's cognitive science. <laughs> you don't make your cognitive science you cog. Cognitive science has proven that non-native language processing affects different brain areas, employs different mechanisms, <coughs> and operates less efficiently and more slowly than native processing. Really? Based on what? Neuroimaging techniques that measure changes in neuronal activity is indicated by changes in blood flow to particular brain areas. My psittisha mama, I need her more than ever now. Yes, there will always be a distance between you and your words. Oh, will they always reside as aliens in a strange land? Your voice is a giveaway. They don't sound like they're in their natural place in your throat. Oh, my very body is of two minds about them. Stop saying, oh, it's like you don't mean it, but I'm taking the part of Othello. Hi, are you saying you read Othello? It was a requirement in boarding school. <laughs> um, the stuff that Parrot expla exclaims, my psittisha mama need her more than ever now, do you know what that is? It's my psittisha mama need her more than ever now. It's a song um, that was first made popular in the 1920s by Sophie Tucker. And it's a super interesting um, uh, second language song because, well, okay, on the one hand, she periodically in that song breaks into Yiddish in the kind of, in the lyrical moments when she's trying to impersonate her mother. But what's, what's, that in a way is obvious, but what's really interesting about it is that it's in this, um, the English part is in this incredibly affected artificial Hollywood English, and it's so fancy that it seems pathetic, but not pathetic in the, in the derogatory sense, but pathetic meaning full of pathos. I mean, it's this incredible, or uh, maybe I'm just projecting. I mean, it's this incredible linguistic job where they do this, this kind of, um, where the language is so idealized and normalized that the person speaking it seems like somebody who's speaking, somebody who is a native speaker of another language that they suppressed or forgot. And I don't know whether that's on purpose, but. It's called Maidi Shimama. It's called Maidi Shimama, yeah. Also Tom Jones is a little bit. Um, but that's what I was thinking of when I, uh, um, And this is a different main line that's from William Carlos Williams from Pure Products of America. Um, and I'll give a sign when that line is there. Do you think this island has any indigenous people on it? If it does, we won't understand them. Are they us? Indigenous people never have any common sense. Why never? Have you met all of them? I don't have to meet all of them. That's what logic is for. If they had common sense, they would emigrate. If they emigrated, they would no longer be indigenous people. QED. But Parrot, why should they emigrate? But Pirate, why shouldn't they emigrate? Should they sit here all their lives? Don't they deserve a second chance? Why do you take it upon yourself to speak for indigenous people? 
If I don't speak for them, who will? Somebody has to speak for them if they don't have any common sense. Most of what they know is numb terror under some hedge of choke cherry of viburnum, which they cannot express. <sighs> poor indigenous people. Poor, poor indigenous people. Oh, poor, unfortunate, indigent, endogamous, ingenuous. Poor, genuine people, my Pope's nose. What if they show up to and ask to see our visas? <laughs> but we don't have any. We don't even possess passports. That's what troubles me, pirates. Suppose we get deported. <laughs> we must persuade the indignant people that in our culture it's not proper to ask pirates and parrots for passports. <laughs> How can you persuade anyone of anything if they don't have any common sense? But are you sure they don't have any common sense? I mean, you proved it, but are you sure? <laughs> Let me read you something. Unlike their peers, the Tonga Islanders do possess native numerals up to 100,000. Not content even with this, the French poet Le Comte de Lille pressed them further and obtained numerals up to 10 to the 12th. However, his data was proven upon publication to be partly nonsense words and partly indelicate expressions, so that the supposed series of high numerals forms at once a modest lexicon of Tongan indecency and a warning as to the probable results of taking down unverified answers from <coughs> savages. I can see why you're nervous. Ingenuous people are really hard to talk to. The parrot is reading um, Edward Taylor, Primitive Cultures. <laughs> this is the island of the severe wharf hypothesis. Hello! Nice weather we're having, says the parrot. How do the grammatical structures of your language affect your experience of it? Are you practicing, says the pirate. <laughs> Are you spying on me, says the parrot outside the bushes. That won't work, you know, says the pirate climbing out of the bushes. Why? Their language might lack the expression for the grammatical structures of your language, explains the pirate. In which case, they would have no idea what you're talking about. What do you think I was born yesterday? They wouldn't understand a word if I used words. I'm going to translate everything into signs and gestures. But there, how would you render the phrase, the grammatical structures of your language, in signs and gestures? The parrot. <laughs> no, that's not entirely clear. Have you thought of this? Structures, structures, not strictures. I am trying to do structures. Less force, less force. Look at me, try this. Uh, that might go. Shall we act it out? I'll be the native, you'll be the alien. We go to the opposite ends of the island, we turn around, we walk towards each other, we communicate. They go to the opposite ends of the island, they turn around, and they walk towards each other. Hello, nice weather we're having, signs the parrot. How do the grammatical structures of your language affect your experience of it? Because my verbs have no tenses, signs the parrot. It's all weather all the time for me, baby. How interesting, signs the parrot. I see that not all your sentences are copulative. Don't use that gesture, says the parrot. <laughs> they might get the wrong idea. Um. If we don't get discovered soon, uh, you know what, I'm going to do this one without the pirate voice because uh, it's, it's really, it's almost impossible. If we don't get discovered soon, we'll turn into indigenous people, says the pirate. It's when we get discovered that we turn into indigenous people, says the pirate. We discover ourselves when we turn into indigenous people, says the pirate. We discover we're not ourselves when we turn into indigenous people, says the pirate. So it's better we remain undiscovered. <laughs> Blessed be the undiscovered person whose language is his, says the pirate, drumming. His reactions are natural, his gestures simple, the expression of his feeling unaffected, the parrot says. He does not take dictation from a dictionary, says the pirate, drumming. 
he does not bid come hither to an interpreter that he may communicate with another or himself, says the parrot, strumming. Everybody loves the undiscovered person when he walks into the room. Everybody looks at him and says, would you look at that? The parrot. I'm a parrot. My house has a skeleton in every closet, says the pirate, or is it the parrot? But the limits of his language are the limits of his world. Who's the author of that statement? Yeah, verily, the undiscovered person is likened to a parrot, says the pirate. If a parrot could talk, we wouldn't understand what he's saying, the pirate says. If we say to him, excuse me, we can't understand what you're saying, the pirate says, the he would say to us, really? And you can understand what you were saying? Says the parrot. The makar and mocker of the universe, he placed an undiscovered person on every world. It's the parrot that says that. Most of them invaded other worlds because they thought the undiscovered people on other worlds would be better off being more like them. Evidence favors the pirate. Some are still around, although permanently scarred, says either the pirate or the parrot. If you essay discovering them, they will send a discomforting gesture your way. The content is the pirates, but the discontent is the parrots. O oh, discoverers of that which is as yet undiscovered, as well as of that which is kind of discovered, but not really, consider this person, says, if not the parrot, then the pirate. For as he is a natural, he is an advocate of truths that are self-evident, says, if not the pirate, then the parrot. If he already owns a t-shirt that says, Department of Anthropology, University of Pennsylvania, apparently the parrot. He thinks it actually says, good luck to you and may you have a long life. Consequently, the pirate. Um, okay, and I'll read maybe two more pieces. Here's another anthropological piece. But this one, so the language is archaic, but I think it's almost entirely fake. I mean, I wrote it. <laughs> The thing about natives is that they're truly naive. Natives are wont to sit upon their nates, wherefrom even the tongue they converse in is height native. They're also called naturals, for they hold that to be true which they hold to be true. When another chanceth upon them, they explain him or her how he or she might come to be more like them. For being so helpful, they're also called salvages. Coastal dwelling salvages work shipwrecks. Many a pale Palinuras born ashore by a breach came to the end on the end of a hail salvages spear. They do not know the true worth of things and can be passed inferior values without fear or grief. Whereas their incapacity of notation is supplied to capacity with natation, they live only in the present like beasts. They're as innocent of irony as they are of metallurgy, indeed hearing words, but not the meanings between them. As they're customized in the first bloom of their youth, so they retain even unto their fall. For native custom, oft being to go sans costume, who can tell between costume and hide, whence the saying, custom likes to hide. At feast days, they mount large cars, which cars they festoon with natural symbols, viz. flags, shields, advertising license, and many heads. For it is better to have many heads. This is the saying that oft salteth their commerce. A manifold of natives is called a nation. Nations are ruled by notions. What notions lack for in form, they make up for in force. And the last piece I will read is from the song section. It's called Pirate Parrot Love, featuring Israel Hands. Israel Hands is the name of a pirate in Treasure Island, except there actually was an American pirate named Israel Hands, uh, who was um, uh, an assistant of Blackbeard, of Edward Teach. The pirate and the parrot know how to party. The pirate and the parrot know how to party. There once was a pirate named Israel Hands. His pants were held up with rubber bands. Tis the height of fashion among robber bands. This Israel Hands made signs to his crew. 
Piastres is something I'd like to accrue. I like to count piastres. You can count in two. The pirate and the parrot aren't like everybody. They party hardy. They keep the carrack rocking. They keep the carrack rolling. An old salt spat was an old hand with a spatula. As objects of count, they're kind of blah. But as objects that are round, they're two by R. If you think I cook up what I testify, respect it, sir's conference and verify. If you bite their circumference, you shall taste of the pie. The pirate and the parrot, they're gold school. They party promptly. They don't party partly, they party even on the potty. In the city, the city of Port Royal, in the city, the city of Haradir, you each get a ten to crew a blood of the main. You've recruited us, we'll be your hands on the main. Piasters are real is what we'll maintain. We'll pester people for piasters, those irrational stars. As we sail seas unsoiled, both near and far, with our jolly Roger and our fun pun, Tupai R. Sam Mary's in the house, Long Island definitely in the house. Algiers in the house where they take no jeers. Tortuga with a booger in the house, Aquarius in the house. If you don't know how to party, full gladly would they teach. Витяпора всего попугая, а также в пирате это партийность. Она приобретается пением по партитуре за партой. Она приобретается пионерами. Она обретается в оперативных работниках. It is made operative by crooning Bella Chow from a cruising Maserati. And the pirate and the parrot know how to party. Thanks. How does it end? You have to read it. <laughs> well, we've got some time for questions, but Julie asked, how does it end? My first question was, how did they meet? In, in, in the, the pet, pet store. store. In the pet store. Yeah. Uh, they say. Yes, it was a Mary Flanagan's pet store. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 it's kind of back information. Um, I can ask questions for you. Can ask questions. Um, since I just uh, went to Eugene's other reading two days ago at uh, the Brooklyn bookstore, and that topic was uh, brought up there, they seem to be uh, polyglot, both, both the pirate and the parrot. And nonetheless, they do speak English most of the times. Um, why is it English? Uh, it, does it serve only as a lingua franca in the age of globalization? Or is it something about the structure <laughs> of English that may make, make it a lingua franca for them? As well as a meta language for them to discuss uh, the structures of the, uh, of the languages of the indigenous people. I mean, I think one of the nice things about English is how much of a mess it is. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that uh, English is a, it's really an outlier as a language. And I mean, it's funny that that should be the language that now is a language of globalization. Um, it's very, I mean, if you just think about the phonetics of English as opposed to the phonetics of other European languages, they're completely off. There are all sorts of weird grammatical patterns in English. There are all sorts of, um, it's a Germanic language, but the word order uh, in English has absolutely nothing to do with any kind of Germanic word order. Um, and most importantly, it has all these layers, right, to a much greater extent than other languages. Uh, you know, you have the kind of old Germanic layer, right? Then you have, from the 9th and 10th century, you have Danish and Norwegian, and Scandinavian. Then you have French, Anglo-Norman, right, which is a huge layer, right? And then you have Latin. So if you're dealing with a normal language like German or Russian, and you look at a word, <laughs> no, it's true. You look at a word, you know where the word is from, and you know what it's connected to. Right? But in English, very often, to know what to take apart a word, you need to go to Latin, you need to go to French. 
to a much greater extent than, than, than other languages. In that sense, maybe Ottoman was like that. I mean, Ottoman uh, was extremely different from Turkish. It was, whatever, 70% of the vocabulary was Arabic and Persian, right? I mean, it was this strange compound language. Um, so English, in a way, is suitably messy. But it's also, you can do things with it. So in that sense, English is a great language because um, uh, you never know what's not English. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like for example, with Turkish, you can't just take a foreign word and just stick it into Turkish without changing it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in English, well, I mean, why not? I mean, we haven't gotten to be, uh, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, in the next few decades with incorporating Chinese words, right? Because of the tonal patterns, like, how, you know, because we don't have tonal patterns. Um, uh, but, I don't know, it just, it sucks up all, all these words. You never, you literally don't know where English ends. And that, that's, that's a really cool thing about it. Also, if you look at it historically, um, uh, I mean, English in terms of literature is far richer uh, than, for example, Russian, uh, and far more varied. Um, um, and how can I put this? It's funny if you read like medieval French, right? If you speak modern French, you can read medieval French. But that's not that's not the case with English. If you, it's it's really hard to read certain versions of even 15th century English. French, not a problem. Um, so English, in that sense, is um, I mean, it just has all this variety, right? Um, and um, all, and unlike Russian or French, you know. You can speak it wrong, and it's fine, right? If you speak Russian wrong, uh, you know some babushka is always going to correct you and say, you know, you know, we don't speak this way. And it's always like, well, what do you mean, we, like, we speak this way? Uh, but you don't have that in English. Nobody will correct you. Not like in Russian. <laughs> if you speak <laughs> French wrong, they just don't understand you. Right, well, which is well, German as well. Huh? German as well. German, it's true. They don't understand you at all. At all. Mm -hmm. At all. Yeah. Yeah. But English, it's all right. I think it's it has to do with again the variety, the geographical variety of English in Brooklyn is all right, and that must have been the best or where they both come from, right? At least somewhere in the vicinity. But perhaps in Queens English, it's not quite all right. Uh, if no? Queens English. In is Britain. it different? Not, not for still. Not, not, <laughs> not, not the borrow, right? What, what do you mean, Queen English? By Queen English? British English. British English? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. You just um, sort of made a nice juxtaposition. Brooklyn English, and I'm like, no, Queen's no, English. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. The Bronx. That's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but yeah, uh, the pirate is not is not multilingual. I mean, the parrot is poly. Because he's a bird. Huh? Because he's a bird? Yeah. But what's funny is that if you look at, um, if you, if you look at basically the image of the parrot in the 16th and 17th and 18th century in England, parrots are, were taught French. They were taught to say things in French because for two reasons. One is that it made their hosts, their masters or mistresses or whatever, seem sophisticated to their friends, if they had a bird that spoke French. But the other thing is that because it was the English, that was their idea of a foreign language. Like French wasn't, it wasn't French, it was like foreign language, right? So I, I never came across any record of a parrot that spoke Dutch. 
<laughs> and I mean, I looked. Oh, you, did, you, you did research. I did research. There's actually, wait, can I read something about perhaps yeah. some foreign languages? Okay, so this is, uh, I, this is, I took almost, this is almost verbatim from Locke, from the uh, later edition of um, uh, essay concerning human understanding. And the only thing that I did was, okay, so uh, uh, the historical background to this is this. Brazil used to belong to Holland, right, before the Portuguese got it, for a while in the 17th century. Um, uh, and Locke, at one point living in the Netherlands, met the former regent of Brazil, uh, Prince Maurice, and interviewed him. And this, this was part of the interview. So what's funny is that in the, the text is in English, but when, uh, when the prince is speaking to the parrot, it's in French. Is that what the foreign language is? Even though they're supposed to be speaking Dutch and Portuguese. The prince had heard of such an old parrot when he came to Brazil. When it came first into the room where the prince was with a great many Dutchmen about him, it said presently, what, co what a company of white men are here. They asked it what it thought that man was pointing at the prince. It answered, some general or other. When they brought it close to him, he asked it, where do you come from? He answered, Petropolis. The prince, whose are you? The parrot, I'm with a Portuguese guy. The prince, what do you do for him? The parrot, I look after the hens. The prince laughed and said, you look after the hens? The parrot then said, yeah, I'm pretty good at it too. The parrot spoke in Brazilian. The prince had taken care to have two interpreters by him, one a Dutchman that used Brazilian, and the other a Brazilian that used Dutch. He asked them separately and privately, and both of them agreed in telling him just the same thing that the parrot had said. <laughs> There's your polyglot parrots. What do you consider a native language? What's your definition of native language? Which language is native? I mean... In this book, there is no native language. It's imagined, because they're on a deserted island. But still, you use this word. What does it mean? They argue about it. I mean, <laughs> I, when I, I guess when I use it, I'm thinking about um, it's a, the romantic idea of the native language, which in some ways is still uh, the basic idea. It's the idea that has some support, which is the first language that you learn in your infancy. Okay, the first is... Yeah. Yeah, but still, I mean, there's many people who, I mean, who have uh, very little knowledge of the language they spoke first. Right, like the parrot. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but if you look at the way the concept of the native language really develops in like the late 18th, early 19th century, it develops in German Romanticism, and then the first thing that it's connected to is nationalism. It's, ethnic, it's national ethnic identity. And what's curious about it, for example, is uh, I regularly teach, there's a great essay on translation by Schleiermacher, who's a, a German... Uh, uh, scholar uh, of the early 19th century. And uh, it's, uh, that's the position it takes, is that your native language is who you are. Uh, and consequently, Schleiermacher is incapable of envisioning anybody who's bilingual. Incapable. Because such a person would have a double identity. Uh, and uh, it's inclination because that's that there's a it's, you know it's not just that it's it's actually psychological because it's also and cognitive cognitive because you know he says people think differently in different languages so if you are thinking in two languages uh, for him you I mean you're basically two people in one it's really it's it's a really curious passage.
So that's where our idea of the, the native language comes from, which in German is Muttersprache, right? Uh, or in Italian also, not in English. Uh, so it's this biological connection to the nation. Were those interpolations of neuroscience actually real? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I got confused about the anthropology. You have to sort of study the source text, I think. I mean, what did you get confused about? Well, I, I don't know. He obviously, it's, it's very clear that they are referring to specific scholarship or specific point yeah, of view, but, and I don't know. Right, it. but look, the whole joke is there's <laughs> all this anthropological discourse, a lot of it old and uh, prejudiced by our sense. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a discourse of othering and of otherness. Uh -huh. But the joke is there's no indigenous people there. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, no, of yeah. course. Just as probably... Uh, that was one of the questions you were just. Uh, they are anthropologists on the field too, mm -hmm. and they themselves are the objects of study. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is that is that a question? <laughs> is, <laughs> uh, is there any theory that they want to prove as anthropologists on the field trip, and how do they themselves prove or disprove their theory as subjects? I, you know, I don't think they have time for theories. I mean, they're, it's based, they're trying to communicate. It's a man and a bird. They're trying to, like, communicate. It's very hard. <laughs> and they want to remain undiscovered. Uh, they're not sure. The stuff with undiscovered, the stuff with the naturalness of a natural language, weirdly enough, is from uh, a Hannah Arendt letter about... Um, a friend of mine in Berlin wrote a book on Hannah Arendt translating herself into German, uh -huh. right? Because she, most of, like, Origins of Totalitarianism and blah, 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 was written in English. But then there are German editions of it. And no, and if you look at the German editions, they're actually quite, quite different. They're, she's not the main translator, but she works very closely with the translator. So, and she has letters where she reflects on, on translating herself into her native language. Do you have to operate in German and in French, or in Paris only in English? In, well, do you mean my job? Yeah. In, I teach in English, but a lot of the administrative stuff is in French. So you, you basically are with all the three languages all the time, plus Russian in between. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm surrounded <laughs> by them, yes. <laughs> But it kind of makes me dysfunctional. I mean, I can't go from, I can't just flip. Yeah? Flip. No, it's very hard. Children don't seem to have any Children problem. don't don't have a problem, but I'm not a child. It's hard. I, I <laughs> no, I felt really vindicated because I was talking to somebody who uh, uh, is a professional translator, interpreter, and lived in Paris for a long time as we were working with French. And now is living in Berlin and commuting. And he's like, you know, the when I get the first two days when I get to Paris, I can't I can't do my work. I don't understand anything that's going on. So I mean, he's a professional. But what about the the, the people who do uh, synchronized translation? I mean, they just they just go from ear to mouth I mean, without translating actually, without putting it into words. <coughs> You but mean without putting it into concepts? Into word. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, without it's hard for me to say. I've never, I've never done synchronous since. I've, I've never, never worked synchronically. So. But they also do it between two languages, not between several. Yeah, uh, I mean, they do. No, 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 no. The, the, this guy, uh, uh, what's his name, Pavel uh, Palashenko, he does French and English. Okay, no, 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 but the issue is different. The issue is that of linguistic environment and uh, the way that the linguistic environment creates a certain kind of noise. Um, so if you're constantly surrounded by one, it's one thing when you're living here and you're surrounded by English 
and then you know you speak Russian and some other language. Yeah, you, that's we could be used to that. That's not that's not very hard to flip. But if when the language of the environment changes and the culture, yeah, that's really hard. I mean, at least for me, it's much harder. I mean, I have major problems. With by simultaneous translators sit in the booth. Yeah, maybe. Problem. Or on an uninhibited dialogue. No, but it, it's, it's still an interesting concept because in my in my mind, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but the, the, the people who does uh, synchronized translation, they don't do interpretation in their heads. It, it goes without, like I said, you say concept, I said words, but it goes without word by word translation. It just naturally comes into the ear and, and, and goes out of the mouth. It goes well, without meditation. In other words, me mediation, sorry. Without <laughs> without meditation. <laughs> and meditation. <laughs> no, it can't, it can't do it. It's not natural and, it, it, and of course it's mediation. Where is meditation? Because you're trained to do it. You're trained to yeah, do it. This trained. means that you... You, you just do it fast. You you don't, yeah. No, no, well, it's not... You don't think of it. So, I mean, when you translate, you get a phrase, you translate a phrase in your head, and then you speak it out, right? Here, there is no translation part in the head. I mean, it does. It, 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 I've never done simultaneous. I can't, you know, he, can't, I can't, he can't account for this parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So I'm interested in your, in those gestures when they were trying to, when you were doing the, the movements. How, how, how I mean, I just do them differently. <laughs> how I mean, do you do it in the text? Yeah. It in the it's not represented in this text, uh, but uh, because I thought about representing it graphically only like yeah. the last, uh, basically the last round of proofs, and it was too late to do it. But we did it in the German text. There's, oh, a, Ger there's a German edition of it with, uh, with visual signs. <laughs> it's fake hieroglyphs. It's fake what? Fake hieroglyphs. <laughs> I, I don't think I have a German word. Okay. So, uh, now that you've let them out, both the parrot and the pirate, into this book, uh, I'm not asking if you feel deserted by them, abandoned, but <laughs> what's, what's the next? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure that I'm done with them. I'm not entirely sure. I'm really confused. Because they've appeared in your uh, previous books. They have, right? yeah. But I always thought of doing a trilogy <laughs> with Spinoza. Uh -huh. um, and then Morris and Pasternak. And then The Pirate and the Parrot. Um, and Right now, the little work that I do, I don't have a lot of time now, uh, but it's mostly stuff associated with Morris and Pasternak, which I thought I had finished. Or maybe it's not, a, it's vaguely, so it's not a basis. So, but I really don't know what's going to come next. I would like to, I would like to learn how to write prose, like a novel or something, but I don't think I can. This feels like a lot of interaction with the teaching, like probably yeah. like lots of texts well, and find, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sort of like the theory and the letters and the literature find their way into this in a playful way, right? Have you ever thought of uh, a more conventional, non-conventional play as opposed to a novel? I'm not suggesting, but mm -hmm. it's just so much of, so, so theatrical and Maybe, uh, and it's all dialogue. Yeah. It should be staged. Huh? It should be staged. Yeah, maybe. I actually think the other way around, that this can be a very cool way of teaching Spinoza and anthropology yeah. and Descartes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Very... Yeah. A way of engaging. 
Yeah, undergrad. Mm -hmm. My God, mm -hmm. I would like somebody teach me philosophy like this. Right? Okay, lock. <laughs> well, let's, well, actually, um, there's a store in Paris which is called uh, Little Plato's Petit Plateau. I know. And they do, yeah, they do children's books uh, uh, for like of famous philosophers. And I was very excited when I and at Marginem they do Russian versions yeah. of that Marginem and they do they basically do them in English and German da, 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 da. and they're very beautiful but the texts aren't so great one could do really much better mm -hmm. I mean they already have it you will find uh, what were they looking for not galleons what they were what's the money the, the piastres you yeah. will yeah. find a lot of piastres with this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Piastro is a piece of lady text. That's, that's the yeah. same. No, there's also piastres. Yes. No, it's, it's the same thing. The piece of lady, they have this uh, uh, plasters. So it's just Spanish name for the piece of lady. Right. But then, uh, for example, Ottoman currency was piastres. There's, there's, it, 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 it's like, it's like the, the dollar and the dollar. Yeah. Right. I mean, other, other people say that. But yeah, it's piece of lady. Good? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you.